praise you for your word, which is the truth. We do receive your word this day, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. We thank you for all that you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're going to share with you on the subject of how to obtain the mind of Christ. So we're going to begin to talk to you about the area of your mind. We've talked about the fact of our heart in the past. We've talked about the fact that of our soul, our soul needs to be restored, healed, liberated, be renewed. We talked about how we are to, we cannot walk in the ways of the flesh whatsoever. And today we're going to talk about the area of your mind. In Proverbs chapter 23, in verse 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. It's speaking about your thinking. Now, first of all, we do need to bring forth something that's important. Notice the word heart is used twice in this verse. We have the ability with this program to put the cursor over the particular word and to show you the Hebrew or the Greek word, if we're in the New Testament, behind it to see if it's translated correctly. We want to be sure it's translated correctly because if it's not, we could be deceived. I put the cursor over the first word, heart. I want you to notice it's the word nefesh. This particular word is translated soul. It can also refer to the mind. It does not mean heart. I put the cursor over the second word, heart, down here. It is the word lab, which means the inner man or the heart. Unfortunately, the King James Version has made an error and translated this incorrectly. This is talking about as a man thinketh in his soul, as Young's literal translation, that's the YLT that we put beneath, it's the finest New Testament, and one of the, it's very good in the Old Testament as well, but the finest New Testament translation that I know of today, Young's literal translation. So it says, as he thinks in his soul, or that would be in the area of our mind, because our soul is made up of our will, intellect, and emotions, and where do we think? We think in the mind area of the intellect. As you're thinking in your mind, so are you. Now that tells us something pretty important. If we're not thinking right, we're going to be in trouble. Because we could be, however you're thinking is the way you are, and you want to be sure you're walking right in the ways of the Lord. So we must get the mind of the Lord. We must have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's two important things. We need to get the mind of the Lord so we have his mindset, so we think like he thinks. And we also must conquer the enemy who comes against our mind, trying to stop us from having the mind of Christ and trying to deceive us through his lies and his deception so we will not think correctly. Over in Romans, Romans chapter 11, verse 34. In Romans 11, verse 34. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who knows the mind of the Lord? The Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Lord. God knows, of course, the Father, Jesus, they know the mind of the Lord. But do we know the mind of the Lord ourselves? No. It's not in us, within ourselves. But can we know the mind of the Lord? Absolutely we can. We see over in 1 John, chapter 5. 1 John, chapter 5, over in verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come, Jesus has come, and he's given us an understanding. Now the word understanding, put the cursor over this word, it is the word dianoe. This particular word comes from noe, which means the mind, and this is talking about a way of thinking in your mind, more literally. So he's given us a way of thinking in our mind, or as Young's brings it out more clearly, it's, there's a different word for understanding in the Greek. He's given us an, a way of thinking in our mind that we may know him that is true. That tells you something. We can have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we will have the way of thinking so we can know him. That also tells you if we don't know, if we don't have the correct mindset, we'll never know the Lord. God wants us to know him. He wants us to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with him so we can know him. But we've got to have our mind renewed to the truth of God's Word. In Isaiah, chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55 tells us something. It says, beginning here in verse 7, 
For my thought, verse 7 that is, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Is man who's unrighteous, is his thoughts right? No, they're not the thoughts of the Lord. They just come from man, the fallen state. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your, my, your ways my ways, saith the Lord. That tells us something. Our thoughts in ourselves are not his thoughts. His thoughts are different. His ways are different than our ways. What's going to be the answer? He says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we've got to get the higher thoughts into us. And we can get the higher thoughts into us through the word of God. He says in verse 10, As the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It comes down to you and me. It shall not return unto me void, it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent. And it gets sent into our minds and into our hearts, so that we will know the ways of the Lord. God's thoughts are very deep, the Bible says. It's over in Psalms 92. Psalms 92, we see in verse 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. His thoughts are very deep. But he will reveal his thoughts unto us. He will bring forth revelation of his mind in us. How does he do it? You can't do it yourself. It's only God's the one who's going to accomplish it. And he wants to do it. And he will do it. We see over in Luke 24, in verse 45, this is when Jesus was revealing the truth about the Old Testament scriptures about him to those who were those ones after he'd been raised from the dead. And it says here, Then opened he there, the King James says, understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. I put the cursor over the word understanding. It is the word nous, which means mind. It's translated mind. The majority of the times, this program has the ability to show these Greek words, how often they're used. This particular word is used 24 times in the New Testament. 21 times correctly translated mind. Three times erroneously translated understanding. Well, how can you say it's erroneous? Because here's the word for understanding when I put it down here. It says that they might understand the scriptures. This is the word, sun iame, which means understanding. Of the 26 times it's used, it's translated understanding 24, which is correct. Now, we share this with you because we're not trying to get on and down translations. We're only interested in one thing, truth. And if they're not right, we have to take a look and find out what's truth and what's not, what's not truth. Then opened he their mind. Even Young's didn't pick this one up for some reason. Usually he corrects all these errors. Then opened he their mind that they might understand the scriptures. God is going to open up your mind to understand the scriptures, to bring revelation to you of his ways. You cannot understand them in your own self. The natural man can't understand them. They're all spiritually discerned. So, he wants to open up your mind. And we see a prayer that was prayed for the church at Ephesus, where he said in verse 16, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The word knowledge here means precise, correct knowledge. God wants you and I to get precise, correct, revelation knowledge of the word. Not what we think it might say. We've got to know exactly what it says. Precise, correct knowledge. And notice, it's the knowledge of him. Not about him, but it's of him. And then he goes on and says how it's going to happen. The eyes of your dianoi, mind and your way of thinking, the eyes of your mind, so you can have a correct way of thinking, being enlightened. God is going to open up 
the eyes of your mind, your spiritual eyes, so that you will be able to be able to learn and know the ways of the Lord. You're going to be enlightened, that you may know what's the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. It's a prayer that they prayed. It's a prayer you can pray for yourself or anybody else. Just plug in your name and pray the prayer. You know, you could pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the precise, correct, accurate knowledge of you. That the eyes of my understanding, or the eyes of so-and-so's understanding, you can pray this prayer for them, of the eyes of their mind, that is, being enlightened, that they may know what's the hope of your calling, the riches, the glory of the inheritance and the saints. As you pray the word, God performs it, and he will open the eyes of your mind. They'll be enlightened so you can have the way of thinking in your mind so you can be able to understand the scriptures. Now what is happening when you hear the word and the word is coming to you, God is taking that word and he's not only opening the eyes of your mind, but he's going to do something with it. In Hebrews 8.10, it speaks of the new covenant and what he does in these days. He says, this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. This is speaking of the New Testament, the new covenant after the resurrection of Jesus when the New Testament's come into being. He says, I will make, uh, says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So notice he takes his word, which is his laws, his spiritual laws, and he puts it in your mind, and he writes it in your heart. In Hebrews 10, 16, it says the reverse of this. It says, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So God is going to put and write his word in your heart, and he's also going to put it and write it in your mind. You need it in your heart, which is the inner man on the inside of you but you also need to have it in your mind, and that's absolutely essential. Now, as the word is coming into your mind, what's it going to do? Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. He says, Be not conformed to this world. You and I are not to be fashioned alike to the ways of this world. Actually, the word world is the word age, this particular age where Satan is dominating in this particular age. But instead, you are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transform is the Greek word metamorpho, from which we get our English word metamorphosis. And it means to change into another form. Remember, metamorphosis is the, pro if you remember from science class, it is the process whereby the caterpillar is turned into a butterfly in a change of species. That's exactly what God is going to do in you. He's going to change you from a carnally-minded, worldly-minded person after the flesh into a spiritually-minded, heavenly-minded, being able to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are going to be transformed. And how, what's going to happen? There's going to be a renewing of your mind. This word doesn't mean just throwing some facts into your mind. It's stronger than that. It means a renovation a complete change for the better. God wants to renovate and completely change your way of thinking. We need to gut everything that we used to the way we used to think after the ways of the world, and now we're going to think after heaven's ways. Why is that? Because you have been born from above. You're a part, if you're born again, you're a part of the true church, and the only church there is is one church, the church of the firstborn. And in Colossians 3, 1, he says, if you then be risen with Christ, talking about spiritually, you've been raised from the dead, you've been born from above, you're a part of the church of the firstborn. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Otherwise, we're born from above, but we're living here on this earth, but nonetheless, we can seek the things above. He wants you to seek the things that are from heaven above. And remember, his thoughts are higher than ours, and so we're going to seek after his word, his ways, so we can learn the thoughts of the Lord, get the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ and know of him. He says, set your affection. This is the word phrenio, which means to have an understanding in your mind, it's referring to, a little different from the other word understanding, 
This is a word to have really an understanding in mind or to be able to think correctly with a spiritual understanding in your mind as you set your affection to have that on things above, not on the things on the earth. Are you going to get it from the things on the earth? No. How are you going to get a mindset that is going to think correctly? You're going to set your mi mind on things above so you can be able to know the ways of the Lord. And that is what God wants to bring forth. So he's going to take his word and his word is going to be written in your heart. It's going to be written in your mind. It actually gets implanted in you. In James 1, verse 21, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Your soul, the area where you have will, intellect, and emotions, where your mind, where you think from, in your mind, is going to bring salvation to that, to change you, to transform you, to heal you, keep you safe, sound, give you a sound mind. And he says, receive it. This word receive is not the normal word that we see off, so we talk about often as lambano, which is a self-prompted taking hold of. This is a Greek word, dekamai. Dekamai is a passive reception as opposed to lambano, which is an active reception. This is a passive reception, otherwise a ready reception. So you are to have a ready reception with meekness, your attitude, submission, and yieldedness unto the word of the engrafted word. And the word engrafted means implanted. It's going to be implanted in you, which is able to save your souls. It has the power of God. This is the word dunamai, which comes from dunamis, which means power. The word of God is the power of God, which will be implanted in you, that will bring you a way of thinking that will produce the salvation of the Lord, bring his victory forth in your life, that you will know the ways of the Lord. Now, another thing that's important, as you are listening to something, whatever it might be, you've got to be sure that it's the right thing. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And this is talking about the ones at Berea. This is where he came to Berea. So this is the Bereans it's speaking of. The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word, they had a ready reception, decamai of the word, with all readiness of mind. They had a readiness of mind to receive this word and searched the scriptures daily whether the things were so. That's important. You want to be sure what you are hearing is the truth. Is this in line with the scriptures or not? Is someone telling you something that is in line with the word? Is it the truth or is it error? There's much error taught in the body of Christ on most all subjects out there. We have a major problem in the scholarship in the body of Christ, in the ministry. People have not studied the word as they should and seen the truth. We've already seen. If you don't look up in the translations, you can be teaching things that are contrary to the truth of the word. We've got to check things out. So they search the scripture daily whether the things were so. God wants you to search the scriptures daily to see if the things that you hear are so. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, in order to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do have to get rid of some things. And he says in Ephesians 4, 22, that you're to put off, put off, or put away, put aside, concerning the former Conversation. Conversation refers to the manner of life, conduct, and behavior. All the ways that you acted, the way you thought, your behavior, which all comes from your mindset of what you have, your outlook on things. You're to put off the former behavior of the old man. The old man is that man after the flesh, which was walking according to the human nature way, the lower way, man's thoughts, which are not God's thoughts, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. The old man is corrupt because of the deceitful lust coming from the flesh. We cannot have a human mind from the flesh. We must have a mind that's renewed to the word of God so that we will have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's corrupt, the old man. is. So you've got to get rid of that. And he goes on and says, you're to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, it's interesting in the Greek here, the word mind 
is actually plural in the Greek. I can show you that here when we come. Talk about the mind of you. This is plural, the plural, the mind of you. It's a plural word here when he's referring to the pronoun here about your mind. So he's talking about being renewed here, being renewed, you're going to get your mind renovated, changed, transformed through the Word of God. In the spirit, because what do we need? We need a spiritual mind now. Get rid of the carnal mind. We're going to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. He's talking about to all of them. Your mind's got to get renewed in the spirit. We're going to get renewed so we have a spiritual mind instead of a carnal mind. A mind that's thinking after heaven's ways instead of after earthly ways. If we see things, we have a mindset after the earthly ways, we're never going to walk in the way of the Spirit. Because God's way is the way of the Spirit. His Word is Spirit, and it is truth. He goes on in verse 24, and he says that you put on the new man. As you are being renewed in your mind, in the Spirit, the spiritual reality of the truths of God's Word, you are actually putting on the new man. And this word, put on, is a word and duo in the Greek, which means to clothe oneself. You are actually putting on spiritual clothes, so to speak, through the word coming into you, as you put on the new man. And this word here, when it talks about this, this is your responsibility to do it. God is not going to put it on for you. You are going to put it on. The reason you know that is because this happens to be a middle voice. Now for you here for the first time, if you've never heard this kind of teaching with bringing up this, don't be overwhelmed. We share all these things, but they're extremely important to understand. Tense, there's tense voice and mood of verbs, and they're very specific in the Greek especially about what's being said. The voices, there's three of them, active, middle, and passive. If it's an active voice verb, the subject is doing the action, or it has something to do with the uh, subject. If it's a passive voice, the subject's being acted upon by somebody else or something else. If it's a middle voice, it means the subject is doing the action for his benefit. He's responsible to do it so it gets done for his benefit. And that's what it's talking about here. You are to clothe yourselves, is the way you would translate this, the new man. You are to clothe yourself with the new man, which after God is created, or was created, in righteousness and true holiness. You are going to get the word of God in you that is going to put on and clothe yourself with this new man. We must get the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must have a spiritual mind. Now, over in Romans, Romans chapter 7, Paul talked about the situation that he was dealing with, and he had quite a dilemma as he was learning and growing in all these things. You and I, of course, we grow up in all these things as well. And he says in Romans 7, 15, he says, That which I do, the things I'm doing, I allow not. For what I would, what I will to do, that do I not. Otherwise, things I want to do, I'm not doing. Things that I don't want to do, I am doing. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why in the world am I doing something I don't want to do? Somebody, something, there must be some desire within me. I want to do the right thing, but something else is in me causing me to not do the right thing, or do something wrong, and not even do the things I want to do. He says, what I hate, that do I do. That I'm doing. If, I then, if then I do that that I would not, I can send the law that it's good. Now, then it's no more I that do it. I'm not doing these things that I hate. But it's sin that dwells in me. Where is sin dwelling? Sin is dwelling in the flesh. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Where does the will come from? It comes from the inner man on the inside. He comes down, again he says that sin that's dwelling in me. I find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. But I delight in the law of God after the inward man, that's the hidden man of the heart, the inner man on the inside. So he has a desire from his heart to do the right thing, but he's got something dwelling in his flesh, sin dwelling in his flesh, causing him to do the wrong thing. 
warring against him. He says, I see another law in my members of the flesh, warring against the law of my mind, working against my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members in the flesh. So something's warring against him. He's not able to walk in the way he's supposed to, he wants to walk. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's an important thing to understand. We talked about it on Wednesday. Your flesh is a body of death, and you cannot walk after the flesh by a human nature way of looking at things, by your feelings, or by a carnal aspect or way of thinking. No, we've got to get a renewed mind to the Word of God. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death that's got sin dwelling? It's causing me to do all these wrong things. He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he says, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. You've got to make sure that your mind is renewed to heaven's ways. So you have a spiritual mind, having put on the new man, thinking as God wants you to think, so you'll serve God, do what he wants. If not, you'll have a mind after the flesh that will cause you to serve the law of sin and lead you down a destructive path. He goes on in chapter 8, in verse 5. He talks about something important. Not only do you need to get your thoughts in your mind, but where your focus is is extremely important. You can have the Word of God that's come in your mind, but your focus is not after walking after the Word of God. You'll walk in the flesh and call, see all kinds of destruction. He says in Romans 8, 5, They that are after the flesh, whatever your focus is, whatever you're seeking after, whatever your focus is after, if you're after the flesh, you're going to mind the things of the flesh. If I'm looking just to go after the walk in the ways of the human nature, whatever I want to do, without considering the Word, that's walking in the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, they're going to be minding the things of the Spirit. So it comes down to, part of it is, not only what you have in your mind, but also where's your focus. There's many Christians that have got the Word in their mind, but their focus is on walking after their own ways. They don't submit to the Word. They don't think, what does the Word say in every situation? And they end up walking after the flesh. They end up reacting after the flesh. They know the Word says you should walk in love, but they get in themselves in strife and arguments and have bitterness and resentment and anger and negative things because they're all reacting out of the circumstances or the situations from their mind, a carnal mind, instead of thinking, what does the Word say? And speaking spiritual or doing what the Spirit says. Spiritual things from the Word of God. To be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's what you and I are going to get. We are going to get a spiritual mind, a mind that has revelation of the ways of the Spirit. And this is extremely important. Now, over in 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. See, you've got to, before we read this, let's go back to Romans for a moment. You've got to realize when Jesus came, what happened? He got a brand new, he came, of course, the, the word was made flesh and dwelled among us. Well, whose flesh did he get? He got the flesh from Mary, remember. Was that righteous? Was that holy? No. It was sinful flesh. Notice what it says. For the law, what the law could not do, and it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus had sinful flesh. That didn't mean he sinned, but he had the ability to sin. He didn't have flesh that wanted to do the right thing. He had flesh that wanted to do the wrong thing. He had sinful flesh. And so what did he have to do? He had to suffer in the flesh to make sure, this, so he, could, he had this attacks that come against him from the desires of the flesh, but he couldn't yield to it. He had to yield to the Spirit and do whatever the Father wanted him to do. Verse Peter 4, 1, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, he did, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He suffered from the flesh by not yielding to the flesh 
And because he didn't yield to the flesh, he yielded to the spirit, he did everything what the Father told him to do, he only did what the Word said, he ceased from sin. If you will not let the flesh have dominion, you will cease from sin because you're going to yield to the spirit instead of yielding to the flesh. And we talked about how we walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. That's going to be a key for you. You've got to be committed that you're going to live to the will of God, not in the flesh to the lusts or strong desires of men. We're going to live to the will of God. How can we know the will of God? God's word is the will of God. It is spiritual law. And God is taking his word and writing it in your heart and writing it in your mind. And you then are to take hold of that and not yield to the flesh. You cannot let this flesh rise up against you and overtake you. You're going to be focused after the spirit, not after the flesh. So you don't have a carnal mind, but instead you have a spiritual mind. Now, in Romans chapter 8, it mentions over here in verse 27, He that searches the heart knows what's the mind of the Spirit. There's a mind of the Spirit, and there's also a mind of the flesh. The Holy Spirit, He knows the mind of the Spirit, and He will also, of course, He'll know what's going on in the flesh. We want to get the mind of the Spirit in us, which comes through the Word of God as the Holy Spirit brings revelation to us. He will take this and write it in our heart, write it in our mind, so we will have a spiritual mind about us. Another thing that's important is to, you must have a mind that is, we already saw about with meekness, how we receive the Word of God. But in Acts chapter 20, verse 19, it says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. You and I must have a humility of mind. Otherwise, not a prideful mind, not a I know it all mind, when it's humble and submitted unto the Lord, yielded unto Him. Humble and pride are opposites. Pride thinks they've got it all together themselves. I, I, I. No, your mind, you're going to have a humility of mind submitted unto the Lord. It's important that you submit yourself unto Him. If you don't submit your mind unto the Lord to think on what He says in every situation, then you operate out of pride. You can't do that. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, I say through the grace given unto me to every man that's among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't ever think more highly of yourself. God doesn't want you to think low about yourself. He wants you to see yourself in Christ but he doesn't want you to ever be exalting yourself because who's the one who's doing all the work in you? God is, and through you, God is. We are nothing, we're just a vessel. we just yielded to him. He's the one that does all these things. But we're to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Think soberly or with wisdom, this is talking about, in such a way, and that's going to be because of the word of God. Now this humility of mind, is something that you're responsibility to, responsible to put on, as we see in Colossians 3.12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. You're going to put this on. And this happens to be this word put on. is the same word and duo that we see, which was to clothe yourself. Middle voice again, you're responsible to do it. In fact, this is a command. It is an imperative mood verb. You and I are commanded to clothe ourselves with these things, including humbleness of mind. You're responsible to make sure you have a mind that's humble and that you're not going to yield to any pride whatsoever. Because your walk must be with humility. If you're going to have the mind of the Lord, you've got to have humility. Ephesians 4.1, Therefore, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you how you'd walk worthy of the vocation or the calling this means, wherewith you're called, with how? A lowliness, this lowliness of mind. This is the same word where we saw humility of mind in the Greek. And meekness with long suffering for bearing one another in love. You're going to walk with a humility of mind that is absolutely essential. 
with this humility of mind, you're never going to think you're better than somebody else. If you think you're better than somebody else, you've got a problem. Philippians 2.2 says, Fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through vain, strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Anytime you start thinking you're better than someone, you just let pride get into you. You cast that down. You think of each other, esteeming each other better than themselves. So you don't ever be exalting yourself. Any exalting will be done by God, not by yourself. Also, if you're going to have the mind of the Lord, it must be in line with righteousness. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 5. The thoughts of the righteous are right. Where am I going to get the thoughts of righteousness? From the word of righteousness. God's word is the word of righteousness. His word is always right. So how am I going to think correct thoughts? I'm going to think, what does the word say in every situation? If you don't think what the word says in every situation, then you must be thinking about things from your own human standpoint, which will produce a carnal-minded attitude. With a proper mindset of thinking what the Word says in every situation, yielding, submitting your mind unto the Lord, humbleness of mind, you can have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ in operation. Even though you've got the Word in you, if you don't yield to it, and you don't put humbleness of mind, you could know the Word, but you're walking on the flesh continually. I see a lot of Christians that do that. They, got, they know the Word, but they're operating in the fleshly mind almost all the time even though they know a lot of things. No, you've got to put it in operation and be submitting your mind in line with the Word of God. Absolutely essential. And you need a mind that's willing and ready to do what God wants you to do. It's not just getting the thoughts in your mind and knowing what's right. You need to have a willing mind that you're going to do what's right. You're going to put it in operation. 1 Chronicles 28, 9, Thou Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, serve with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. A willing mind is a mindset that's ready to do what God wants. My mind's willing to obey him, to serve him, to carry out the things that he wants me to do. That's what God wants. He wants a willing mind in you. And then, he, of course, he wants you to do all these things that he tells you to do. That is very important. You've got to have a mindset not only thinking correctly, in line with the Word, but a mindset that's going to do what God says. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35. He says, I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and my mind. Remember, Eli, he was a priest, this is talking about, but he wasn't doing what God told him to do. He wasn't restraining his children from evil. He was not doing the things he was supposed to do. But now he says, I'm going to raise up a faithful one that's in my heart and my mind, and I'll build him a sure house. He'll walk before my anointed forever. God wants us to get what's in his heart and his mind in us through the word and then do it. If you're going to be someone who has a willing mind, then you're going to be doing what is in his mind. And we can know the mind of the Lord through the word in us. In Psalms 119. Psalms 119. We see over in verse 59. Psalms 119, verse 59. I thought on my ways and turned my feet under thy testimonies. That's an important point. You need to think on your ways. Do you think on your ways before you go and walk in your ways? Do you think on what the Word says before you speak or before you do choose to do things? Before you, you know, set your agenda for what you're going to do? Are you thinking of what God says in His Word? Thought, I thought on my ways. And then he says, I turn my feet into thy testimonies. I'm going I'm to make sure I'm going to walk my feet, you know, step by step, in line with what you want me to do. That's what God is looking for. And he wants your mind to get so established in the things of the Word of God, with a willing mind ready to do what he says. Proverbs, 20, uh, Proverbs 16, verse 3. He says, Commit thy works 
unto the Lord. You're going to commit the works or your deeds unto the Lord, what you're going to do. And thy thoughts, what's supposed to happen with them? They shall be established, or they're going to be stable, they're to be fixed on what God wants you to do. You commit your way that I'm going to do what he says, so my thoughts are going to be established, they're to be set, they're to be firm, that I'm going to do what God wants, so that I will walk in the ways of the Lord. You've got to have yourself committed unto the way of the Lord, though, to, to, to works of the Lord. Commit your works, what you're going to do. I'm going to follow his ways. Otherwise, I'm not just going to get all these facts in me, spiritual facts, and have all this knowledge and not do it. If you won't do it, you aren't going to see the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ be established in you. Because the devil will come and he will take that word out of your heart. And God, if you don't, so if you don't walk in the ways of the Lord, as you'll hear at a later time, he, he'll turn a person over to a reprobate mind. Because they aren't doing what he says. See, God expects you to walk in line with his word. When he brings his thoughts to you, it's not for you to like pick and choose and think about it and, oh, I, I like these thoughts, but I'm going to keep walking in my own ways. No, that doesn't work. You are to submit yourself and walk in the ways of the Lord because you have come into covenant relationship with him. Now, God wants to bring you to the place of having a mind that is sound and set. 2 Timothy 1.7, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sound mind's what God wants. One that is set, one that is controlled by the word of God, so you will not yield to anything else. And of course, you need to be after the things of the spirit, not after the things of the flesh. At the same time, you gotta make sure that you're governing your mind so you're not letting any evil be operating in your mind. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Pure refers to that which is pure, that's, that's sincere, or it also means, when you look it up, spotless or unmixed, a mind that's really set on the word, a pure, sincere, spotless, unmixed mind or way of thinking. That's what he wants. So he's bringing my way of remembrance to stir up their minds so that they would think correctly and be exhorted on the things that they should do. Another thing is, if you're going to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, it can't be going this way and that way and back and forth and all over the place. No, you need to have your mind settled on the Word and be fully persuaded that what God has said is true. You've got to know the Word is true and you've got to have your mind renewed to the point where you know it's so. Of course, this was because of study on your part. Romans chapter 14, verse 5, where he says, Let one man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You've got to be fully persuaded in your mind what is right, so that you will know what is right. How am I going to be fully persuaded? Because I get the word in my mind, and I see exactly what the word says. You're to be fully persuaded. This is the case when Paul mentioned in verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus. There's nothing unclean of itself. To him that esteemeth any to be unclean, to him it's unclean. If he thinks it's unclean, it'll be unclean to him. But he says, I know there's nothing unclean now. There's nothing unclean. Talking about food they would eat. Well, that was all the Old Testament things had all these unclean things they couldn't eat. But now in the New Testament, now it's after the way of the Spirit. There's nothing. That was all a revelation of all the uncleanness in the natural that would be revealing uncleanness in us in this realm of the Spirit. He said, there's nothing, the food's not causing me to sin. It's not making me sin. Now, instead, it's what's going on in my mind and things of the, of, of, of the, the contrary to the word, of, of the, the word of God or to the Spirit that would cause me to sin. So he's persuaded. You've got to be persuaded. And this brings us to another point. You can't be double-minded. You certainly will not have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ if it's double-minded. We see in James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Your mind's this way, your mind's that way. You've got to have your mind set. How am I going to get it set? I'm going to study the Word. I'm going to know what the Word says. I'm going to get exact, precise, correct knowledge. And I'm going to look at all the scriptures so I'm not confused at all, so I'm not going to maybe miss out on some things. I'm going to make sure that I've studied 
to know the word. A double-minded man is unstable. He's unstable. He's not going to be able to be constant in all his ways. He'll vacillate. He'll go every which way. God wants your mind so set that in a situation comes, you'll be willing and ready to do what the word says instead of being tossed this way or that way and not knowing what to do. We cannot have a double-mindedness. Double-mindedness shows instability in your life spiritually. Chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now, what does that tell you? Double-mindedness will have an effect upon your heart. Because he says, purify your heart, you double-minded. Otherwise, the double-mindedness has had a negative effect upon their heart. You see, all the gates that come into your heart are all your faculties, including your mind. If your mind is not single-minded, if it's double-minded, it will cause an impurity in your heart. You will not have your heart set to, uh, upon the Word of God and believe exactly what he says. So, that's another important point for you to get your mind renewed and get it to the place where it's established on the Word then it will not cause an impurity going on in your heart. Another thing, we must be ready to deal with negative thoughts that come against us. When a thought presents itself to you, you must think on whether that thought is in line with God's word or whether it's not. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful, this means to be anxious for nothing. Is anxious something that God would want us to have? No. He wants to be at peace, doesn't he? Be anxious for nothing. Now that's from the enemy. But what are we supposed to do then? And everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests, which is the word I tame them, make a demand of what's due you as you pray the word, be made known unto God. And otherwise, I'm not going to be anxious for this. I'm going to pray what the word says. And what's going to happen then? Then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, or, again, this is this word, noose, mind, which surpasses the mind, the word pass, pass means to really, to be able to be superior over the mind, shall keep or guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. It'll guard you in these areas. That's because you don't yield to the anxiety. You don't yield to that worry. Instead, you pray the word. So where's your focus? On the word. And what's going to happen? The word is going to bring the peace of God into you that will guard your heart and mind, and it's going to be able to surpass what's the things that are going on in your mind. You're going to also take that thought captive in line with God's word. This is essential. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, over here in verse 5. You and I are to cast down imaginations, which would be mental reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself or raising itself up against the knowledge of God. Because what's our mind to be submitted to? The knowledge of God. Something's raising itself above the knowledge of God, wants you to do this instead of the knowledge of God. Oh, that's coming from the enemy. That's not coming from God. You are to cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And you are to bring into captivity, lead away captive, every thought to the obedience of Christ. If you will learn to govern your mind in line with the word, you're going to be on your way to have the mind of Christ. The battleground with the enemy is in the area of the mind. Even though you might have a lot of knowledge, the enemy will still try to bring negative things into your mind. You've got to guard your mind. You've got to cast down those mental reasonings and every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And you've got to be ready to bring into captivity every thought in line with the obedience of Christ. In fact, he even wants you to have a readiness. This means being prepared and ready to avenge or revenge all disobedience, the disobedient thoughts that are coming at you. You should have a mindset that I'm ready to deal with any attacks that come against me. And the battleground, of course, is in the area of the mind. Now, don't think that God is the one that's bringing these negative thoughts to you. No, it's the devil who does that. Jeremiah, chapter 29, in verse 11. 
Look what he says. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. He certainly knows what thoughts he thinks. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Is he bringing the thoughts of evil to you? No. It's coming from the devil. God's not going to bring thoughts of evil to you. He's going to bring thoughts of peace. Because he wants to give you the promises of God, the expected end. He wants to bring the promises of God into manifestation in your life. So you've got to get your thoughts thinking correctly about what thoughts are coming in your mind. If they're not in line with what God's word would say, it's not the Lord bringing that thought to you. That's the devil bringing that thought to you. And you need to cast that thought down. Isaiah Chapter 26, what does God want for you? Verse 3, thou wilt keep him or watch over him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Wherever your mind is stayed or supporting or leaned up on, propped up to, wherever it's focused on, essentially, what's in it and where it's focused, that's going to be the key. If your mind is stayed on the Lord, on the things of the spirit, after the things of spiritual mind, then you're going to stay in perfect peace. That actually shows that you trust in him because your eyes are upon him. Your mind is set upon him. You can't say, I trust in the Lord, and your mind's on all these negative things. You're not trusting the Lord. If your mind was stayed upon him, you'd be in peace. What do you mean? How can you tell me I don't trust in the Lord? Well, the word says, if, you're not, if your mind's not stayed on him, obviously you're not trusting in him. Your mind's on all these other things. The devil's got to your mind. You might have trusted him in the past, but at that moment, you're not trusted in him at that moment. You let the devil get to your mind. God wants us to govern our mind with the word of God. And what does he say? He'll keep you in perfect peace. We come over to 1 Corinthians 2, in verse 11. He says, What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, once you're born again, you get the spirit of Christ. Then you receive, this is the Lombano, receiving the spirit of the Holy Spirit. And what's he going to do? He's going to reveal these things to you, that you might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Remember, God's the one who opens up our minds to understand the scriptures and to know all the things that God has freely given unto us. Now, the words that come to you that are going to bring this are going to be spiritual words. 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Anything that the Lord is going to bring forth is going to be spiritual revelation, spiritual words teaching you spiritual truths. So you can have the revelation of the ways of the Spirit, which is the things above. The natural man, this is the, the, God, the soulish man, the man is run by his soul. He receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Now, before a person is born again, they're in the natural. They, don't, they aren't tuned in at all to the Lord. But even we see that some people that are even after they're born again, they still seem to be in the natural, in the soulish realm, and they don't get the real revelation of the Word of God. They can even think they're foolishness unto them. Neither can he know them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit is going to open up the eyes, remember, of your mind so that you're going to be able to understand the scriptures. It's spiritual discernment. You're not going to figure it out yourself. This is why we have such a problem with so many teachings out there, especially about prophetic things, and so many people that are reasoning in their mind, trying to figure all this out in their mind, and they're missing the whole boat. You look at the scriptures and you say they, they know that they're true and you thank the Holy Spirit for opening the eyes of your mind and bringing revelation of the truth to you to reveal the truth to you so you understand the scriptures, not figure it out yourself. This is why we have such a big problem in the body of Christ. They're not spiritually discerning things by the Holy Spirit revealing it. He that's spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. 
Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Otherwise, somebody's got to know the mind of the Lord so he can tell him what's going on. Well, he says, we have the mind of Christ. How'd they get the mind of Christ? Through the Word, by the Holy Spirit, revealing these things to them, opening the eyes of their mind and taking this Word and writing it in their heart and writing it in their mind and understanding that my focus must be after the way of the Spirit. I must think on what the Word says. I must take my thoughts captive. I must keep my mind stayed on what its Word says. All these things that we've talked about, things that are in line with righteousness, these are all keys in order to see that you are going to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is absolutely essential. God wants us to get the mind of the Lord Jesus. Now, in the past, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify on the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as the Gentiles or the nations, the multitudes walk, in the vanity of their mind. Vanity refers to that which is devoid of truth. Otherwise, they're not considering the truth. They're just walking after whatever's in their mind. That's the way the world walks. And that's the way carnal Christians walk, too. They just think whatever comes in their mind. They're not thinking what the Word says. A mind that's devoid of truth, you'll just walk in the flesh and it'll produce death. In the a mind that is devoid of truth, it is absolutely essential that you and I get the Word into our mind, but we need to make sure that we're going to submit to it and do it. Having the understanding, which is dianoi again, the mind with a way of thinking, darkened. Their minds darkened. Why? Because they're walking devoid of truth. What's the truth? The Word. If you don't submit your mind to thinking on what the Word says, there'll be other stuff that'll come in your mind and you'll end up walking in a way that's devoid of truth. You'll be walking and your, your mind, a way of thinking, will be darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance, lack of knowledge that's in them because of the blindness of their heart. What happens? If you don't walk in the ways of the Lord, you're going to walk in the ways of the flesh. And what's the ways of the flesh? It produces sin. And what happens when you walk in sin? Sin is deceitful and it will cause a hardening in your life. Because when it says because of the blindness of your heart, this really refers to like a hardening, a hardening of their heart, calloused heart, a hardening of heart, hardness of heart, as Young's brings out really what this word means. Why? Because they didn't walk in line with the word. See, when you hear the word, it is important that you have a willingness, a readiness to do what it says and put it in operation and incorporate it into your lifestyle, and then you're going to think on what the Word says in every situation, which is so important. If you don't do that, then you'll end up, if you don't submit it to the truth, you'll walk in the ways of the flesh, and you'll walk just like all the nations walk. No, we need to have our mind thinking on the right things, which is thinking on what the Word says in every situation. Also, Another thing that's important for us to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ is we know that the enemy will work against us by bringing negative thoughts. But we also must understand that demons will work in your mind to hinder you as well. In Mark chapter 5, here's the man who came out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. He had his dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him, no, not with chains because he had often been bound with fetters and chains, and chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Always night and day, he's in the mountains and the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. I mean, he was in a terrible shape. The demons were running this guy. So, he wasn't able to choose the right things because he was bound by the devils. When he saw Jesus afar off, he could do something now when he saw Jesus. Even though he was being controlled by these demons, he did have the will to make a choice. Because when he saw Jesus, he could run to him. This tells you something. People that have demons in their mind, they can never excuse, give the excuse, well, the devil made me do it and I couldn't choose to come to Jesus. 
No, this guy, the devil was causing him to do all these things and had him bound, but when he saw Jesus, he could run to him. If the man from Gadara could run to him, any of us can run to him, that's for sure. Ran to Jesus afar off and he ran and worshiped him, even though he was so bound. Cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou most, son of the Most High? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. That's a demon crying out because Jesus was already beginning to cast the demon out, telling him to come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Now, as Jesus cast the demons out of this guy, we come to verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Notice. When the guy had the demons cast out of his mind, now he was in his right mind. But it's more than that. Some people approach deliverance that just cast this out and everything will be fine. I'll be in my perfectly right mind. Not so. Why? Because there's more to it than just getting the demons cast out of your mind. We're going to look over at a parallel verse because notice here it says he had the legion. He's sitting. If you just kind of picture this, he got him cast out. You think he's just sitting on a seat or sitting somewhere. He's got his clothes on now and he's right mind. Well, that's not really the total picture because you've got to look at all the accounts. In Luke chapter 8, verse 35, we see the picture better. They went out to see what was done, came to Jesus, found the man and of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus. He went just sitting, doing nothing. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now that's a little bit different. Now we're talking about something different. Clothed and in his right mind. So in this case, the demons were cast out, but else, what else was the guy doing? He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And that's what produced, uh, you know, brought the right mind, but also he was clothed. We talk about sitting here at the feet of Jesus. This, was, this is talking about an ongoing, it's a spiritual revelation. It's a present tense verb, which means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. I mean, he was continually sitting at the feet of Jesus, a revelation of what a person needs to do. And what happens when we sit at the feet of Jesus? Remember what that was all about? We'll come back here in a moment. Remember about Mary? In Luke chapter 10, down in verse 39, Mary and Martha. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his word. So someone sitting at the feet of Jesus means, or spiritually, the revelation is continually hearing the word. Continually hearing the word of God. And that's important. We need to continually be getting our mind renewed to the word so the word is continually ministering unto us. Now we go back over to Luke chapter 8. In verse 35, how did this guy get to the place of being in his right mind, a sound mind? The demons were cast out of him. When it talks about these demons being cast out of him, this happens to be a pluperfect tense. The pluperfect tense is somewhat of a rare tense, and it's not a common one in the Greek. It means an event that has been accomplished in the past time with results existing in the past but says nothing about continuing results at the time of the speaking. It just says it happened in the past and it was accomplished in the past. So this guy got the demons cast out of him. When we talk about the sitting at the feet of Jesus, this is continuous, as we mentioned, the present tense, continuous action of hearing the word ongoing. And then it says he was clothed. Don't think that's just talking about putting on clothes. Remember, these are all spiritual revelations that are, we need to understand. When it talks about being clothed here, here, this happens to be a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense in the Greek means completed action in the past with continuing present results at the time of speaking. So what does this tell you? This guy had the demons cast out. He's continually sitting, hearing the word of God. 
The result of that is he's spiritually clothed now, completed action, but it's got continuing present effects ongoing in his life. Why? Because he's continually hearing the word, right? He's continually hearing the word. And then what's going to be the result of that? Now he's in his right mind. All the people that think that just cast out the demons and everything will be fine, they don't know what they're talking about. If you aren't getting in the Word of God and hearing the Word of God continually and letting God renew your mind and dealing with all the problems in your life at the same time to correct them and get a willing mind and a mind that's renewed to the truth and not a mind of the flesh anymore, but a mind after the Spirit that's going to think correctly and choose correctly and have a mindset after the things of God so you serve the law of God, if you don't have that, you're not going to get free. And furthermore, you've got to come to the place of clothing yourself, being clothed, having this put on, this new man, remember, so you're going to walk in it, and with a continuing, ongoing effect in your life. You've got your spiritual clothes on now. You've got spiritual clothes on. Your guard is like having armor on. When it's, this is the same word when it talked about how you put on things and you clothe yourself. When you put on the armor of God, it's the same word in the Greek. You clothe yourselves with the armor of God. And that guy then is in his right mind. So the spiritual revelation is important for everybody to understand. You cast out all the demons till they're all gone. It's an ongoing process. You sit at the feet of Jesus continually and hear the word of God and deal with all the areas in your life and incorporate this into the way you think, the way you choose, the way you walk, all these things, because you can't cast them out and then cannot get filled up with the word and walk in line with it. Otherwise, they're going to come back in with seven more wicked. You'll be in worse shape. You're not going to get, in fact, you'll never get free of all of them anyway. That's why a prerequisite for deliverance is you've got to be committed to the word of God and walking in his ways. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. You're going to get worse. Lots of people have demons cast out, and the people never spiritually located them and really determined whether they were really right and really wanting to follow the way of the Lord 100% or not, and then they get worse later. Because they approach to just cast the demons out, everything will be fine. No, they failed to understand. You've got to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. You've got to cl get clothed spiritually. So that it's an ongoing effect. You've got your spiritual clothes on, and then you'll be in your right mind. See? So God wants us to understand what it's going to take to get the mind of the Lord. Now, casting out demons is important because we've got to get set free of all of the effects of what demons have done in us. And he wants us to get free in every, every area in our life of bondage. Now, what does God want us to come to? A couple more scriptures before we close. He wants you and I to come to the place of having the word in us that we will have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 5, The God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. He wants us all to be in one accord, one mind, one mindset, one mouth as well speaking. We want our mind being renewed to the truth of God's word so that we're walking after the way of the word. 1 Corinthians 1.10 He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. If we're all got our mind renewed to the truth, and we're all got our set self that's ready to do it, we should be speaking the same thing. That there be no divisions among you. That you be perfectly joined together. That's how we're going to be knitted together in the body of Christ, and become powerful and mighty, in the same mind and the same judgment. We got ourselves filled up with the things of God. That's what God wants. He wants us to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he's going to bring us to. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. God wants us to go on to perfection. Be of good comfort. Be of one Mind. This word really means same mind. Be of the same mind. It's not the word for one. It's the word that means same, as Young brings out. Be of the same mind. Live in peace. The God of love and peace shall be with you. He wants us all to get the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, the same mind, because we get the word in us, and we put the word first place, and we think on what the word says at all times. When you do that, 
then you are going to get the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ established in you through the Word. But you're also going to have to keep it. You're going to have to guard it. You're going to have to watch over it and make sure you're walking in line with His ways. So we've seen a lot of important things. As you're thinking in your mind, so are you. So we've got to get the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us a way of thinking in our minds so we can know Him and we can possess the promises in our life. We've got to forsake unrighteous thoughts. We've got to know our thoughts are not His thoughts because His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. What's going to bring His thoughts to us? The Word of God. But how is it going to come to us? God's going to open our mind to be able to understand the Scriptures that are spiritually discerned. As He opens up our mind, then we're going to have that understanding the Word's written in our heart, and it's also written in our mind, and it's going to cause a transformation, change in species from a worldly-minded to a spiritually-minded, carnal-minded, spiritually-minded now, spiritually-minded person, changed, so that now you will have a renewed mind, completely gutted, complete renovation, absolute change in your mind. In order to do this, you've got to set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. You can't be mining earthly things. You've got to be mining the spiritual things. You're going to accept the word that comes in. You're going to have a readiness of mind. You're going to be ready to apply it in your life with a willing attitude. You are going to be ready also to deal with all thoughts that come from the flesh because anything that's coming from the flesh, contrary to the word, is going to produce a fleshly mind and cause you to sin. You're going to get your mind renewed, and with your mind, you're going to serve the law of God. Your mind's going to be focused on the things of the Spirit, not after the things of the flesh. And you're going to have the mind that's a humble mind, meekness, submitted mind, yielded mind unto the Lord. And you're going to put on this mind, this new man, through the renewing of your mind. It's going to be in line with the word of righteousness. You're going to have a willing mind ready to do the word, remember. If you're not ready to do it, well, what in the world are you learning it for? You know? Well, I just want to get a bunch of facts, then I'll think about it. That's a wrong way to think. God does not like that. He's given you his knowledge for you to do it, to put it in operation, not to think about it and decide whether I'm going to do something. We must think about and consider our ways and get our thoughts established. And he wants us to have a pure, sound, sincere, unmixed, spotless mind, fully persuaded knowing what the Word says, not double-minded, not wavering, no anxiety. We take our thoughts captive. We think on good things. He'll keep us in perfect peace as we keep our mind stayed upon Him. And as we then get the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, also, we cast out all the demons that are hindering us in our mind, and we sit at the feet of Jesus, continually receiving the Word, and we clothe ourselves with the Word so that we are going to have the mind of the Lord also so we'll be protected like armor from the enemy coming and trying to take the Word out. As we think on the Word and do what the Word says, you will get the mind of the Lord established in area after area after area after area as you receive the Word. As you're receiving all these messages we've been bringing forth, I trust you're taking this and you're putting an operation in your life. You're not just, oh, I, I heard that and then go off and do something else. That's a mistake. The devil will take it out of your heart for sure, and your mind will not be set to do the word, and you will not, you'll not see God's fruit come forth in your life. We need to have our mind set, and God wants us all to come to this place of one mind, perfectly joined together in the mind, thinking the same way, same mind, same outlook, ready to do what God says in every situation. That is what he's going to do in the body of Christ as a whole, and that's what he is doing in your life. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that reveals how to obtain the mind of Christ. I understand. As I think in my mind, so am I. I'm going to get the mind of the Lord. It's not coming from me. It's coming from the word. I thank you that you have given me a mind so that I can know you. It'll come through the word. As I receive your word with meekness, with humility, submissiveness to you, ready to do the word. The word is written in my heart and the word is written in my mind. I will always check out 
what's coming into my mind to be sure it's in line with the scriptures. And as I'm receiving the word, it is renewing me. It is changing me, bringing me into a spiritually minded person. As I put the word first place and my mind's after the things of the spirit, I will have a spiritual mind. I'm going to put it in operation by doing the word of God. And I will be established in it. I will be persuaded that it is the truth. I will not be double-minded, but I will have my mind established and stable in the truth of the Word of God. I will also cast out all the evil spirits that would be hindering my mind. And I thank you that as I get my mind filled up with the Word, and I put on the new man, clothing myself, walking in line with the word, mind set on the word, I will have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is spiritually discerned because I'm receiving it by the Holy Spirit and putting it in operation, doing it in my life. I thank you, Lord. I will get in the Word, do the Word, keep my mind upon the Word, guard myself, take my thoughts captive, not let the enemy bring negative thoughts into my mind. I will be ready to bring every thought captive in line with the Word so that I will think on what you want me to think on. I'm governing my mind according to the Word of God. And I'm not going to give place to anything that is of the enemy. I will have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ because I receive it, I walk in it, I do what He says, and that's my way of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You do these things in area after area, you're going to see great things happen. In the areas where you have done it, you've seen fruit. In the areas where you haven't done it, you haven't seen fruit. Even though you might have some mental knowing of it, the word can be taken out of your heart and you can have all this other negative stuff come into your mind. Also, that's why you got to guard yourself. Don't let yourself get all confused and get double-minded. This is a problem. You've got to know what the word says and you've got to study the word, of course, at the same time and then be a doer of it, which is the key. If you do, don't do the word, you'll deceive yourself and you will not see the promises come to pass in your life. Father, I thank you and praise you for all that you brought forth this day. Thank you that we are going to obtain the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ through your thoughts in us that we get in our mind by your revelation and writing it in us. We'll do it, we'll keep it, we'll guard it, we'll make sure nothing else is going to come in and we will walk in it and it will bring forth great fruit and victory in our life. Thank you for the establishment of the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ in us as we're doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen.